Good morning. Do you hear me okay? Yeah? Great. Okay, so we're going to sit together for about 45 minutes and then I will read you one of the teachings of the Buddha. Enjoy your meditation.
Letting Okay, so now we are well established in the med- middle part of our retreat and some of us starting to find that balance point in our practice, starting to go a bit deeper. Some of us sometimes as well stuck in frustration, difficult state. At this point in the retreat, I want to invite us all to consider this one really helpful consideration that is usually a way into greater depth. And the reflection is this. What are we still clinging to? So just this act of coming to a month-long retreat, we already put down a lot of burdens. We don't have to go to work for a month. We don't have to worry about our phones or the media. We don't have to worry about being sociable. Many things we can put down. But as we meditate more and more, we might get the sense that there are some things we're still clinging to might be a style of thinking that we can't put down, a memory from the past that we are very loyal to. It might be an emotion that we want to revisit again and again, like, you know, like when you lick an ulcer. I want to go feel that pain again and again. It might be an ambition or an expectation that we can't let go of. It might be some form of identity that we're unwilling to put down, some sense of who we are. It might be a story or an enjoyable place that the mind likes to go to to play. Many things that we can still be subtly clinging into when we're meditating. And so I invite us today to make this exploration. What are the things that we're still holding on to? And can we loosen our grip on those things? If possible, maybe for the rest of this retreat, we can let go of them completely. What are we still clinging to? Can we put those things down? Can we unburden ourselves even more? Regarding this, I'm going to read one of the suttas, one of the teachings of the Buddha. This one's a bit long, but it's very good. So, yeah, listen, listen well. Thus I have heard, on one occasion the Buddha was living in the country of the and Gutrapans, where there was a town of theirs named Apana. Then when it was morning, the Buddha dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Apana for alms. When he had wandered for alms in Apana and had returned from his alms round, after his meal he went to a certain grove for the day's abiding. Having entered the grove, he sat down at the root of a tree for the day's abiding. When it was morning, the venerable Udayan, dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, he too went to Apana for alms. When he has wandered for alms in Apana and had returned from his alms round after his meal, he went to the same grove for the day's abiding. Having entered the grove, he sat down at the root of a tree for the day's abiding. Then, while the venerable Udayan was alone in meditation, the following thought arose in his mind. How many painful states has the Buddha rid us of? How many pleasant states has the Buddha brought us? How many unwholesome states has the Buddha rid us of? 
How many wholesome states has he brought us? Then when it was evening, the Venerable Udayim rose from meditation, went to the Buddha and after paying homage to him, he sat at one side and told him, Here, Buddha, whilst I was alone in meditation, the following thought arose in my mind. How many painful states has the Buddha rid us of? How many wholesome states has the Buddha brought us? Venerable Sir, formerly we used to eat in the evening, in the morning and during the day outside of the proper time. Then there was an occasion when the Buddha addressed the bhikkhus thus and said, Bhikkhus, please abandon that daytime meal which is outside the proper time. Venerable Sir, I was upset and sad, thinking, faithful householders give us good food of various kinds during the day outside the proper time. Yet the Buddha tells us to abandon it. The Buddha tells us to relinquish it. Out of our love and respect for the Buddha and out of shame and fear of wrongdoing, we abandoned that daytime meal, which was outside the proper time. Then we ate only in the evening and the morning. And then there was an occasion when the Buddha addressed the bhikkhus, bhikkhus, please abandon that night meal, which is outside the proper time. Venerable sir, I was upset and sad, thinking the Buddha tells us to abandon the more sumptuous of our two meals. The sublime one tells us to relinquish it. Once, venerable sir, a certain man had obtained some a certain man had obtained obtained some soup during the day, and he said, "Put that aside, and we'll eat it together in the in the evening." Nearly all dishes are prepared at night, few by day. But out of our love and respect for the Buddha, our shame and fear of wrongdoing, we abandoned that night meal, which was outside the proper time. It's happened, venerable sir, that bhikkhus wandering for alms in the thick of darkness. In the night have walked into a cesspool, fallen into a sewer, walked into a thorn bush, walked into a sleeping cow. It really says that. They've walked into a sleeping cow. They've (laughs) They've met hoodlums who had already committed a crime and those planning a new crime. And they've been sexually enticed by women. Once, venerable sir, I went wandering for alms in the thick of darkness of the night. A woman washing a pot saw me by flash of lightning and screamed out in terror. She said, Mercy me, a devil's come for me. I told her, Sister, I'm no devil, I'm a bhikkhu waiting for alms. Then it's a bhikkhu whose ma's died and whose pa's died. Better a bhikkhu, you get your belly cut open with a sharp butcher's knife than this prowling for alms for your belly's sake in the thick darkness of night, she said. Venerable sir, when I recollected that, I thought, How many painful states has the Buddha rid us of? How many pleasant states has the Buddha brought us? How many unwholesome states has the Buddha rid us of? How many wholesome states has he brought us? The Buddha says, So too, Udayim, there are certain misguided men here who, when told by me, abandon this, say, What, such a mere trifle, such a little thing as this? This recluse is much too exacting. And they do not abandon that thing and they show discourtesy towards me, as well as towards those bhikkhus desirous of training. For them, that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether and a thick yoke. Suppose, Udayim, a quail were tethered by a rotting creeper and would thereby expect injury, captivity or death. Now suppose someone said, The rotting creeper by which that quail is tethered and thereby expects injury, captivity or death is for her a feeble, weak, rotting, coreless tether. Would he be speaking rightly? No, venerable sir, for that quail, the rotting creeper by which he is tethered and thereby expects injury, captivity or death is a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether and a thick yoke. So too, Udayan, there are certain men here who told by me, abandon this, do not abandon that, and they show discourtesy towards me as well as towards those bhikkhus desirous of training. For them, that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether and a thick yoke. Udayan, there are certain laymen here who, when told by me, abandon this, say, what, such a mere trifle, such a little thing to be abandoned as this, The Buddha tells us to abandon this. The sublime one tells us to relinquish it. Yet they do abandon that and do not show discourtesy towards me or towards those bhikkhus desirous of training. Having abandoned it, they live at ease, unruffled, 
subsisting on others' gifts, with a mind as aloof as a wild deer. For them that thing becomes a feeble, weak, rotting, corless tether. Suppose, Udayim, a royal tusker elephant with tusks as long as chariot poles, full-grown in stature, high-bred and accustomed to battle, were tethered by stout leather thongs, but simply by twisting his body a little, he could break and burst those thongs and then go where he likes. Now suppose someone said, the stout leather thongs by which this royal tusker elephant is tethered are for him a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether and a thick yoke. Would he be speaking rightly? No, venerable sir. The stout leather thongs by which that royal tusker elephant is tethered, which by simply twisting his body a little he could break and burst and then go where he likes, are for him a feeble, weak, rotting, corless tether. So too, Udayim, there are certain laymen here who, when told by me, abandon this, abandon that, do not show discourtesy towards me or towards those bhikkhus desirous of training. Having abandoned them, they live at ease, unruffled, subsisting on others' gifts, with a mind as aloof as a wild deer. For them, that thing becomes a feeble, weak, rotting, callous tether. Suppose, Udayim, there were a poor, penniless, destitute man, and he had one dilapidated hovel open to the crows, not the best kind, and one dilapidated wicker bedstead, not the best kind, and some grain and pumpkin seeds in a pot, not the best kind, and one hag of a wife, not my words, eh? one hag of a wife, not the best kind. He might see a bhikkhu in a monastery park sitting in the shade of a tree, his hands and feet well washed after he'd eaten a delicious meal, devoting himself to the higher mind. He might think, how pleasant the recluse's state is, how healthy the recluse's state, state is, If only I could shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life life into homelessness. But being unable to abandon his one dilapidated hovel open to the crows, not the best kind, and his dilapidated wicker bedstead, not the best kind, and his grain and pumpkin seeds in a pot, not the best kind, and his hag of a wife, not the best kind, he's unable to shave off his hair and beard put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. Now suppose someone said, the tethers by which that man is tethered so that he cannot abandon his one dilapidated hovel and his hag of a wife not the best kind and he cannot shave off his hair and beard and put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. For him those things are a feeble, weak, rotting, fallless tether. Would he be speaking rightly? No, venerable sir. The tethers by which that man is tethered so that he cannot abandon his one dilapidated hovel and his hag of a wife, not the best kind, and shave off his hair and beard and put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. For him those things are a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether and a thick yoke. So too, Udayim, there are certain misguided men here who, when told by me, abandon this, do not abandon that and they show discourtesy towards me, as well as towards those bhikkhus desirous of training. For them that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether, and a thick yoke. Suppose I am, there were a rich householder or householder's son, with great wealth and property, with a vast number of gold, a vast number of granaries, vast number of fields, vast amount of land, vast number of wives, Vast number of men and women slaves, again, not my words. He might see a bhikkhu in a monastery park sitting in the shade of a tree, his hands and feet well washed after he had eaten a delicious meal, devoting himself to the higher mind. He might think, how pleasant the recluse's state is, how healthy the recluse's state is. If only I could shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. And being able to abandon his vast amount of gold and granaries, his fields, his vast amount of land, his vast number of wives, his vast number of men and women slaves, he's able to shave off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. Now suppose someone said the tethers by which that householder or householder's son is tethered 
so that he can abandon his vast amount of gold and his vast amount of wives and shave off his hair and beard and put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. For him, those are a strong, stout, tough, unrotting feather and thick yoke. Would he be speaking rightly? No, venerable sir. The tethers by which that householder is tethered so that he can abandon his gold and his wives and go forth from the home life into homelessness. For him, those things are a feeble, weak, rotting, coreless tether. So too, Udayim, there are certain clansmen here who, when told by me, abandon this, do abandon that, and they don't show discourtesy towards me or towards those bhikkhus desirous of training. Having abandoned it, they live at ease, unruffled, subsisting on others' gifts, with mind as aloof as a wild deer. For them that thing becomes a feeble, weak, rotting, coreless tether. Who die in there are four kinds of people to be found existing in the world. What are the four? Here, Udayan, some person practices the way to abandoning of the acquisitions, to the relinquishing of the acquisitions. When he is practicing the way, memories and intentions associated with the acquisitions beset him. He tolerates them. He does not abandon them. He does not remove them or do away with them or annihilate them. Such a person I call fettered, not unfettered. Why is that? because I have known the particular diversity of faculties in this person. Here, Udayan, some person practices the way to abandoning of acquisitions, to the relinquishing of acquisitions. When he is practicing the way, memories and intentions associated with acquisitions beset him. He does not tolerate them. He abandons those thoughts, removes them and does away with them and annihilates them. Such a person, too, I call fettered, not unfettered. Why is that? Because I've known the particular diversity of faculties in this person. Here, Udayan, some person practices the way of abandoning acquisitions, the relinquishing of acquisitions. When he's practicing the way, memories and intentions associated with acquisitions beset him now and then through lapses of mindfulness. His mindfulness may be slow in arising, but he quickly abandons them, removes them and does away with them. Just as if a man were to let two or three drops of water fall onto an iron plate heated for a whole day, the falling of the water drops might be slow, but they would quickly vaporise and vanish. So too, here some person practises the way to the relinquishment of acquisitions. His mindfulness may be slow in arising, but he quickly abandons them, removes them, does away with them and annihilates them. Such a person too I call fettered, not unfettered. Why is that? Because I've known the particular diversity of faculties in this person. Here, Udayim, some person, having understood that acquisition is the root of suffering, divests himself of the acquisitions and is liberated in the destruction of the acquisitions. Such a person I call unfettered, not fettered. Why is that? Because I've known the particular diversity of faculties in this person. There are, Udayam, five cords of sensual pleasure. What are the five? Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear. Smells cognizable by the nose. Flavors cognizable by the tongue. Tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. These are the five cords of sense pleasure. Now, Udayan, the pleasure and joy that arises dependent on those five cords of sense pleasure are called sense pleasure. An unskillful pleasure, a coarse pleasure, an ignoble pleasure. I say of this kind of pleasure that it should not be pursued, that it should not be developed, that it should not be cultivated, that it should be feared. Here are dying quite secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. A bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana. With the stilling of applied and sustained thought, he enters, in the, he enters and abides in the second jhana. With the fading away of joy, he enters upon the third jhana. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, he enters and abides in the fourth jhana. This is called the bliss of renunciation the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace. 
I say of this kind of pleasure that it should be pursued, that it should be developed, that it should be cultivated, that it should not be feared. Here who die in quite secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a bhikkhu enters and abides in the first jhana. Now I say, this belongs to the perturbable. And what therein belongs to the perturbable? The applied thought and sustained thought that have not ceased therein, that is belongs to the perturbable. With the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a bhikkhu enters and abides in the second jhana. Now this I say also belongs to the perturbable. And what therein is perturbable? The joy and pleasure that have not ceased is what is perturbable. Here Udayan, with the f- fading away of joy, a bhikkhu enters into the third jhana. Now this I say also belongs to the perturbable. And what belongs to the perturbable? The pleasure of equanimity that has not ceased is what belongs to the perturbable. Here Udayan, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, a bhikkhu enters upon the fourth jhana. Now this I say belongs to the imperturbable. Here who die in quite secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a bhikkhu abides in the first jhana. That, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say, surmount it. And what surmounts it? With the stilling, and, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a bhikkhu enters and abides in the second jhana. That surmounts it. But I say, that is not enough. Abandon it, I say, surmount it. And what surmounts it? With the fading away of joy, a bhikkhu enters into the third jhana. That surmounts it. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it. Surmount it. And what surmounts it? With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, a bhikkhu enters into the fourth jhana. That surmounts it. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it. Surmount it. And what surmounts it? With the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, with the disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact, with non-attachment to perceptions of diversity, awareness that spe- and of the awareness that space is infinite, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of infinite space. That surmounts it, but that I too, that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, surmount it, and what surmounts it? Here I die, and by com- completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, A bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. That surmounts it. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it. Surmount it. And what surmounts it? Here I am by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing. A bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. That surmounts it. But that, I say, too, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it. And what surmounts it? Here I am, by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. That surmounts it, but that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say, surmount it. And what surmounts it? Here I am, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the cessation of perception and feeling. That surmounts it. Thus I speak of abandoning even the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Do you see, Udayim, any fetter, small or great? Do you see, Udayim, any fetter, small or great, of whose abandoning I do not speak? No, Venerable Sir. That's what the Buddha said. The Venerable Udayim was satisfied and delighted in the Buddha's words. Hmm. So it is a long sutta, but basic meaning of the sutta is gradually relinquishing more and more of the things that we're clinging to, starting with wanting dinner and finishing with even any attachment we have to the highest jhanas. And so I invite us all today to examine what are we still clinging to? Can we release that fetter? Can we give those things up for the remainder of this retreat? Can we abandon them, surmount them?